The paper that I do want to um, present today is, is, is really still very much a work in progress, um, but in some ways it really follows on from this work. Um, so to these days there's quite a lot of emphasis on the responsibility of HIV positive people, both through um, treatment as prevention, but also through the criminalisation um, of HIV transmission and non-disclosure. Um, however, there's comparatively less thought uh, and in fact decrease, a decreasing amount of thought uh, given to how HIV negative people um, actually become subjects of or subject to um, questions of HIV prevention. And this is really what this paper um, is an attempt to begin to think about. Um, the problem, I think, uh, is, is a really tricky one. How might one think about and exercise responsibility at a scene where a large part of the appeal of that scene or that encounter is the sense in which it might promise to suspend or even momentarily to dispel any grip on the rational, responsible, sovereign self. I'm talking about sex. <laughs> um, so this is a vexing problem. Uh, another way of putting this problem is how to attend effectively to pleasure where pleasure consists, at least, at least partially, in some form of desubjectification, that is, some form of losing sight of the self. So this is the sort of paradox, actually, that, that I think we're up against. Um, and I don't pretend to really have any answers, but I would like to share some of my initial thinking uh, on the question with you. So the paper's called uh, Reluctant Objects. <clears throat> These days it's possible to sit through entire conferences apparently devoted to HIV prevention in which the issue of sexual practice is barely mentioned. Recent formulations of biomedical prevention science are conspicuous, for example, in their avoidance of this topic. At the 2012 HIV Microbicides Conference held in Sydney, I sat through paper after paper in which the overriding concern was questions of clinical control. Had trial participants been adherent or not? How can we tell? Are they telling the truth? Has this been tested? Etc. Any interest or insight that research scientists may have had into the everyday sexual or practical lives of trial participants was carefully excluded from consideration by the conventions that shape discussion in that forum. Now, perhaps it's naive or unfair to expect biostatisticians to be ethnographers. And I don't mean this as some sort of professional slur. Some of my best friends are epidemiologists. <laughs> <laughs> Rather, the disregard of sexual practice in this forum can be considered a function of the regimes of evidence that have come to dominate the HIV prevention field, in which the randomised control trial has rapidly emerged as the only way of making decisions about fundable courses of action. In this respect, the HIV field is not that unlike other domains of public health with its aims to predict the outcomes of given strategies, to isolate relations of cause and effect, to calculate the risks of specific behaviours and to establish the efficacy of interventions. Now this emphasis on prediction and linearisation may be thought to have specific value for health policy and practice insofar as it guides policy decisions regarding the administration of treatment, the distribution of resources, therapeutic strategies and the planning of programs. But what is difficult to appreciate from within this field of practice are unexpected processes of ontological transformation that emerge from everyday encounters, including encounters with research and intervention. In other words, the field's investment in scientific evidence has certainly had advantages in terms of the formation of rational public policy. But the definitive knowledge that these scientific practices purport to produce, whether of people or of things, is not without other consequence. Specifically, when objects of research are produced and held as fixed in this way, they're not inclined to participate in active or lively ways in the ongoing construction and definition of the problem, as Isabel Stengers has argued. 
this is particularly apparent in the contemporary field of HIV AIDS where some of the communities most affected by AIDS who were once considered crucial to, in the activity of defining the relevant problems and devising effective responses to them have been largely disengaged from the research and policy process and are largely understood and understand themselves in these terms. So what if we were to approach this situation in part as a problem in the performativity of knowledge? The scientific avoidance of sexual experience in everyday practice has certainly been replicated in influential hallmark policy pronouncements. Take Hillary Clinton's 2011 speech to the NIH where she outlined the administration's proposed course towards an AIDS-free generation. The course was said to consist of the prevention of mother-to-child transmission, circumcision and treatment as prevention. No mention of any practices through which HIV is actually transmitted, except for prevention of mother-to-child transmission. No mention of the circumstances of key affected populations, men who have sex with men, sex workers and people who inject drugs, amongst whom, of course, as we all know, there's a much higher prevalence of HIV infection in nearly every country that collects and reports data on such matters, including those countries with uh, generalised epidemics, such as sub-Saharan Africa. Now, part of the appeal of this vision, the AIDS-free generation, must be its promise to address HIV prevention medically without any mention of awkward topics such as sex or drug use or gender or other structural disparities, uh, including enduring stigma. And yet, as some critics have pointed out, such disparities will actually make or break the effectiveness of biomedical prevention insofar as they materialise as the affective environments in which people are likely to come forward and access care and prevention or otherwise avoid them. What's also interesting about the proposed vision towards an AIDS-free generation is that this is not a straightforward prioritisation of medical approaches over and above the social. I mean, it is, but it's not straightforward. No mention was made of strategies such as pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP, for example, the potential efficacy of which has been demonstrated in recent clinical trials. In this respect, the plan for an AIDS-free generation enacts what I've called a moral hierarchy of HIV biomedical prevention options, in which the new biomedical tools are filtered through more traditional moral prerogatives in order to establish their prominence, priority and public palatability. PrEP occupies a somewhat liminal space here, and from this perspective it could be regarded um, as a very interesting, very provocative boundary object. So on the one hand, it's been evaluated um, and FDA approved, uh, a proven intervention. On the other hand, it raises a host of ethical questions and practical dilemmas. These include the spectre of unlimited sex and the more specific question of how sexual norms may be transformed by biomedical intervention, a topic that HIV biomedicine doesn't, either doesn't want or doesn't know how to think about. So this paper is designed as a modest intervention into a situation in which science would render sexual encounters dumb. And it proceeds by working with this liminal status of PrEP. It's a speculative paper that attempts to make sense of gay men's relation to pre-exposure prophylaxis. My argument emerges from a series of encounters and an overall impression based on my participation in gay culture of what I would venture as a surprising state of disengagement with PrEP. PrEP, I will argue, takes the form of a reluctant object, an object that may well make a tangible difference to people's lives, but whose promise is so threatening or confronting to enduring habits of getting by in this world that it provokes some aversion, avoidance, even condemnation and moralism. I'll suggest that thinking about gay men's engagement, or rather disengagement with PrEP, stands to tell us much about gay men's self-understanding as subjects of risk in the present moment of the HIV epidemic. If, for Althusser, interpolation describes the hey-you moment when a person recognises themselves as a subject of official discourse, we might approach this topic as an inquiry into uninterpolation, the conditions in which one is led to turn away, to linger in a state of non-confrontation, to avoid recognising oneself as a subject of risk. The object of PrEP also forces us to contend with what scares us, not only about risk, but also about sex. The ways in which condoms, for example, have operated in the citizenship arena, not only as a latex, but also a symbolic prophylactic against the apparently terrifying prospect of unbridled homosexuality.
By positioning PrEP as a reluctant object, I don't mean to suggest, of course, that PrEP is an unproblematic object or that concerns about PrEP are unfounded. It's certainly the case that PrEP poses considerable challenges with regard to its effective implementation, use and resourcing, and these are beginning to be recognised in the international field. The issues of non-adherence, risk compensation, cost, unwanted toxicity and the possible development of resistant virus in the context of unknown seroconversion and suboptimal treatment, which is what PrEP would be if you were infected but didn't know it. Um, all of these are real and must be addressed. However, in this paper I bracket these concerns, primarily because these are not the concerns I've encountered when raising the issue of PrEP with HIV-negative sexual partners and friends. People outside the HIV sector haven't even got that far in thinking about it, in my experience. Rather, what I'm attempting to understand is the affective reaction with which news of PrEP is often greeted, a reaction of aversion, often powerful aversion and repudiation, among men who are otherwise familiar with and often have sensible or more, and more or less considered approaches to the challenge of HIV prevention. Understanding this reaction may be useful for thinking about how to present PrEP to the relevant publics and may also help frame HIV prevention as a matter of affective attachments and investments. That is, how people come to attach themselves to particular objects, practices, devices, positions and identities in their attempts to avoid or otherwise navigate the possibility of HIV infection. Which is to say that the aim of this paper is not to psychologise HIV-negative gay men as though PrEP were an object that rational folks cannot but want. I object to those forms of psychological reasoning that take the latest health prescription as an opportunity to pathologise the non-compliant, and I would want to situate the relevant attachments more sympathetically in their historical, cultural and practical contexts. Rather, my hope in pursuing this topic is to contribute to a discussion about how gay men relate to risk today, relate to HIV risk today, especially in circumstances where their practices may be associated with risk. In particular, I want to question where the model of the prudent, rational, pre-calculated subject of risk that we customarily work with in the field adequately imagines how we enter into sex. My paper is also motivated by the immense difficulty I have experienced as an HIV positive man involved in the field, not only in thinking about PrEP, but in trying to imagine how things must appear to people of a different serostatus. Now rather than interpret this difficulty as a personal shortcoming, I'd like to install it as a methodological starting point and default presumption. We do not know what is going on for other people, but must presume not to know and be prepared to be surprised by our encounters. In other words, my thinking emerges from my own initial reluctance to think about PrEP, and then really a series of dumb questions. Dumb question number one. I posted a link on my Facebook page last April to an article entitled A Game Changer in the Fight Against HIV from the Boston Globe. The article was a fairly straightforward, well-written account that outlined the findings from PrEP trials and described it as a promising strategy. Now, given how fed up we all are 30 years on with the persistence of the HIV epidemic and the widespread desire for an end to it, you would think that news like this would attract a little attention. But from among my bevy of overtly gay Facebook friends, shown posing at gyms and parties and parades, only one person liked it. <laughs> Even news about what I had for breakfast attracts more attention. Now, it would of course be foolish to draw any strict conclusions from this flimsy piece of data. And there are a number of ways of interpreting the findings. Perhaps it was the wrong time of day, or a news feed issue, or a problem with my recruitment strategy. My friends are very odd and unrepresentative after all. Perhaps it indicates a case of information overload, or there were other more captivating things going on at the time. Difficult as this line of questioning is to disentangle from the narcissistic preoccupations of Facebook interaction more generally, I think that these considerations might usefully be brought to any survey, online or otherwise, as they stand. Our access to data is always mediated in specific ways and it's good to get specific about these mediations. Ever the social researcher, I decided to consult with another expert in the medium and ask my boyfriend what this appalling response rate could be about. Well, liking it could be taken as an admission of wanting or having unsafe sex, something that people are reluctant to identify themselves with in public. 
he said. So this interpretation is valuable, not necessarily because it's verified or definitive, but because it gives us some partial insight into some of the conditions of articulation and silence around PrEP. Expressing a personal interest in PrEP involves acknowledging to oneself and to others that one practice, one's practices are not as safe as they could or ought to be. This observation could be used to contextualise the apparent absence of public expressions for demand for PrEP, an issue that has flummoxed many clinical researchers in the area. But it also up opens up a broader set of considerations. Engaging personally with PrEP involves confronting oneself, not only as a subject of risk, but as a subject of illicit or socially unsanctioned sex. Encounter number two. This exchange occurred after sex with a 25-year-old HIV-negative man at his home. We'd used condoms, which were conveniently at hand. The guy was clearly well-versed in the practices of arranging casual sex, safe casual sex. After sex, we got into a discussion about our interests and work, and I raised the topic of PrEP. The topic needed some explanation. While he was educated and had a vague sense of having heard something along these lines, he was unclear of the details or of what it might consist. After my explanation, he became quite animated and disturbed. I was surprised at how upset he became. He couldn't understand why people could not just use condoms. On further discussion, it emerged that he'd previously been in a one or two year relationship with a positive man. Since he had managed to sustain condom use, even in these challenging circumstances, he believed condoms should be a sufficient strategy. How can we understand this objection to PrEP and its relation to attachment to condoms? This is where considerations of affect and habituation come in useful, and I'm inclined to theorise condoms along these lines as a difficult but nonetheless optimistic attachment. For Lorraine Berlant, an object of attachment can be understood as, quote, a cluster of promises we want some, someone or something to make to us and make possible for us. For Berlant, a relation of what she calls cruel optimism exists when the loss of that something seems unendurable because, quote, the continuity of its form provides something of the continuity of the subject's sense of what it means to keep on living on and look forward to being in the world. Now, I'm not sure that an attachment to condoms is a relation of cruel optimism exactly, not at least when condoms are used consistently and effectively. But for many gay men, the promise that they offer is the promise of protection from HIV infection. This is a hard-wrought attachment, a carefully habituated practice, which involves incorporating the condom into an affectively charged and potentially disorganising scene of intensity. Despite the difficulty of this attachment and the conditions that militate against it, many gay men have managed to install it as an habitual and ongoing practice. There is a sense in which this process of habituation may be considered to have staved off the unbearable immediacy of the threat of HIV AIDS, at least for those who have lived through the height of the gay epidemic in the 80s and 90s. One of the things that condoms have been good for, in other words, is avoiding thinking too much and too intimately about what at some level is unthinkable, the threat of HIV AIDS. In becoming habitual, the condom produces a measure of freedom beyond immediacy, staving off the unsustainable decisionism of a life lived minute to minute, that is, in crisis mentality. So if condoms have functioned as a way of preserving a mode of ordinariness in a situation of unendurable or ongoing crisis, then this would overturn our usual assumptions about the decisionality of safe sex. In the mode of consistency, we don't decide to use condoms. They are used habitually, unthinkingly, and this operates as a source of comfort. The condom habit may in this sense serve as a means of exempting oneself from a repeated and traumatic interpolation by risk discourse, something that many of us have developed a range of other fine-tuned mechanisms for avoiding. You know, we are not the subject of those irritating, never-ending messages and campaigns. Those other evil barebackers, young gay men, scene queens, sex addicts, fill in the appropriate other are. So in the context of this attachment to condoms, which is at once difficult and optimistic, and the emotional energy and investment it involves, 
PrEP is likely to materialise both as a threatening proposition and a challenging interference. What it threatens is not simply the subject's understandings or preferences in regard to HIV prevention, but the sense of continuity that consists in habituated adherence to a particular formal investment in the cluster of promises that is encapsulated in the object of the condom. In this context, moralism against PrEP can be understood as a way of countering the threat that a different logic, a different package of delivering on this cluster of promises poses to this hard-wrought and strenuously maintained attachment. So this is a relevant consideration, I think, for proponents of PrEP who must find ways of anticipating and responding to this sort of resistance. It's a little bit analogous to the resistance first encountered in discussions of negotiated safety, um, at least in Australia, which posed a similar sort of threat to investments in the formal structure of safe sex. So, uh, as you may know, negotiated safety was the formulation of uh, social researchers and educators who noticed that gay men were dispensing with condoms in the context of regular relationships with partners of the same HIV status, but using them in more casual contexts non-problematically. Um, and the term was coined at a time of immense investment in the condom as the primary guarantor of safety. And so the concept sparked intense uh, and immense um, controversy internationally. This uh, controversy revealed how an object like the condom can become stabilised as a placeholder for intense investments in avoiding risk. And also what happens when the continuity of its form is brought into a question by something like negotiated safety, which proposed that it was okay to dispense with condoms in some contexts. So one of the, th the insights that can be drawn from this episode is the challenge implicit in affirming some people's commitment to consistent condom use while also um, presenting and articulating PrEP among those who may stand to benefit from it. While some proponents of PrEP attempt to insist that PrEP is not a replacement but a supplement for condoms, I don't think this insistence is realistic. Um, it fails to anticipate how PrEP materialises in practical terms, not only as an option but a substitute, and for some, a source of interference. To be specific, what it interferes with is the robustness of those attachments and associations that have made up a basic ontology of HIV prevention among gay men, that is the condom code. So to think further about this question of effectively targeting and articulating PrEP among those that most stand to benefit from it, my next story raises uh, the question of interpolation. That is, how people come to recognise themselves as subjects of risk and possible candidates for PrEP. And so it extends some of the considerations in the previous two scenarios. This encounter involved a discussion over dinner with an HIV negative friend, a thoughtful, intelligent and frank Sydney guy um, about the same age as me. We'd had discussions before about different experiences of serostatus and sex, and again I was surprised to find that he had never heard about or considered the issue of PrEP. His initial response when I described it was marked trepidation and surprise. It struck him as a brave new world proposition that might open the gates to unbridled sex. Not that there's anything prudish or conservative about my friend, quite the contrary, in fact, but when I asked for clarification about his response in a later communication, he wrote ruefully, I can imagine people stocking up on a pre-Mardi Gras and then behaving like cars at a service station all weekend. Fill her up. Then qualifying, but I also meant in the novel's sense of strange sci-fi medicine and how that affects culture. <coughs> So on this occasion, PrEP raises the spectre of limitless sex, a proposition that is at once scary and thrilling, and for this reason may prompt defences. One of the things that perplexed my friend most about PrEP was the temporal relation to risk that it seemed to represent. Despite, or perhaps because of, all the efforts to list us as prudent and preemptive subjects of health, we are in the habit of accounting for sexual risk-taking after the event, as he went on to observe. The representation implicit in PrEP of risk or unprotected sex as premeditated is at once more confronting and a different way of identifying the self in the vicinity of risk, not to mention accounting for that relation. It relies on the sense of a predictive and intentional subject whose propensity to err, that is, have unprotected sex, is fully present and apprehensible to that subject in advance. 
In this instance, this led to a search for comparisons, during which I suggested the contraceptive pill. Um, he rejected the analogy on the grounds that a pregnancy is terminable, whereas HIV is not, or, as he said, not yet. Um, I'm not so sure about this distinction myself, for unwanted pregnancy may sometimes pose a similar crisis of self-viability for women. But uh, those were his thoughts. This led to a discussion of his own sexual and risk practices in which he divulged that he'd been taking more risks in the recent past, that it had been difficult to maintain condom use, and that he had surprised even himself with the risks he'd been prepared to take in recent memory. Situations that might just a year ago have seemed to him unthinkably risky were now situations in which he found himself considering participating. So there's a lot that could be said about this conversation and in many ways it corresponds with other discussions that I've had with sexually active gay men recently that seem to lend some urgency to the search for new HIV prevention strategies, including PrEP. But for the purpose of this discussion, the main point that I want to make is that even though upon reflection he was concerned about risk, and his own inclination to take risks, which he perceived as increasing, PrEP was still encountered by my friend as a challenging proposition, a proposition with which he experienced some difficulty engaging. So what can we make of this difficulty? What's going on here and what can we draw from this discussion? I believe that from a certain perspective at this point in, epidemic, in the epidemic, uh, PrEP emerges as an enigmatic object, the paradox of a planned slip-up. It asks us to preempt a possibility that we've become accustomed to accounting for mainly after the event as an after, or as an afterthought. As a proposition, PrEP asks HIV-negative men not only to acknowledge, but also take systematic and concerted action upon a risk that one may not be inclined to acknowledge so readily. As another friend put it, it's a bit like wearing a bulletproof vest across the road. In other words, a risk that may be acknowledged at some level, but that is rationalised as not much of a risk, or something that happens spontaneously, irregularly, or in the heat of the moment. Perhaps in order to protect oneself from the confronting self-interpretation that will consist in understanding one's risk practice as becoming habitual. It's interesting to contrast what I'm describing here to the figure of the barebacker, whose self-identification could be regarded as an ideal instance of interpolation into risk. Emerging in the late 1990s, the term barebacking was quickly defined in the scientific and public, popular literature alike as the apparently new phenomenon of intentional unsafe sex. A number of commentators questioned the universality of this descriptor, um, and in fact, as Eric Barry Adam has pointed out in an early article, intentionality doesn't even begin to describe the full range of relations to unprotected sex. Nevertheless, the term inspired popular identification in ways that revealed the poverty of dominant modes of accounting for sexual experience and sexual desire, which seem always to require an intentional subject. So given this history, the self-identified barebacker might be considered to be the exemplary subject of neoliberal risk discourse. His willingness to own risk in the mo mode of foresight and intentionality situates him quite firmly in the neighbourhood of PrEP's presumed address. By contrast, the reluctant subject of PrEP discourse does not locate himself at this address and lingers in a state of habitual non-confrontation. In a curious sort of way, then, PrEP emerges as the counterfigure of the conundrum that informs some gay men's use of recreational substances to negotiate the pressures of prevention discourse, which I described in Pleasure Consuming Medicine as exceptional sex. Recalling the popular discourse of disinhibition, the subject gives himself a chance to swoon or escape the pressure of the condom imperative. The paradox here is that the discourse of dis disinhibition, which is associated with drug use, is a discourse that is largely apprehended in advance. Thus, drug use becomes a way of avoiding the, chance of, uh, the charge of intentionality. By comparison, PrEP asks HIV-negative men to confront the structure of the exception head-on, as it were, to identify themselves as subjects of risk in the mode of pre-calculation and intentionality. Perhaps then PrEP is such a reluctant object in part because it makes explicit something that is difficult to be explicit about from within one of the common orientations to sex and risk among gay men today. The desire to position risk as an exception rather than a tendency, a straying afield of oneself rather than something as coherent or culpable as a habit or a pre-calculated decision.
So as I said in the introduction, these thoughts are necessarily speculative, partial and incomplete, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts and impressions based on your own experience of this different context. I see this work as a contribution to the literature that turns to sex and pleasure as domains of encounter and relationality in order, in fact, to critique models of proper personhood as these are idealised in the notion of the calculative, preemptive, intentional subject who is always capable of performing risk-benefit calculations in advance. The overarching question that I hope to develop in, in future work is how to understand and account for dynamics of uninterpolation as I've begun to describe them here, a question whose significance is prompted by PrEP but extends well beyond it because, of course, there are broader questions um, about barriers in access to and uptake of care and the ways in which stigma interferes with prevention and care that acquire particular significance in the context of biomedical prevention. All this to say that while the line of inquiry I've begun to develop in this paper might seem like another set of reasons to put PrEP into the too hard basket, on the contrary I believe it represents an opportunity to do the sort of thinking that's needed to address subjects of risk, pleasure, sexuality and HIV in their present complexity. So that's the um, content part of the paper, um, but I also just wanted to say um, a few things about um, uh, my approach and method. Um, because I think they connect to the earlier discussion of HIV science. So I've often been struck by the sense in which the concepts of evidence that prevail in the social, scientific and HIV policy field require us to disavow our immersion in sexual cultures and forms of pleasure. It sometimes seems as though the way one attains professional credibility and authority in the field is by objectifying sexual practice, making it seem predictable, and by talking about it as though it happens somewhere over there among some group of remote but identifiable others. But this gives rise to a problem that this paper has tried to confront. The very expertise we might wish to cultivate for HIV prevention, expertise in uh, sex as a form of praxis, as a mode of encounter and a source of pedagogy, is actively dissuaded, if not undermined, by some of the epistemic and professional frames that prominently organise responses to HIV AIDS. For whatever else it is, HIV prevention is a problem in the social arrangement of knowledge. That is, the modes that are available for accounting for sex with their regulatory distinctions between subject and object, public and private, actual and virtual, which render certain intimate experiences more or less possible to acknowledge or otherwise ignore. By pushing at these distinctions, I'm trying here to gesture towards and promote the possibility of a practical form of knowledge, reflection, speculation, analysis and agitation that need not pretend to withdraw from the sexual field in order to make worthwhile propositions about it. So in this respect, I've tried to adopt a counter-scientific approach that aims to destabilise and intervene in questions of what counts as worthwhile knowledge about HIV prevention. That is, I've engaged in a bit of positivist drag that cites some of the normative conventions of empirical research, all the better to dramatise its failure to live up to them. A Facebook exchange, a conversation with my boyfriend, a conversation with a sexual partner after sex, and some casual after-dinner conversation with a friend. Surely this is all just anecdotal, not a great data set by any measure. On what grounds could it possibly form the basis for legitimate knowledge? And yet these are some of the mundane sites of intimate exchange and sexual learning that will be familiar to many who participate in sexual community. To take them seriously is to revalue sexual experience as an occasion for insight, revelation and curiosity. To the extent that some of the ideas I've offered here today might serve as a lure for pertinent or creative thought, I hope to have demonstrated the value of thinking, however provisionally, with open intimacy. What I want to do as a postscript is make a couple of comments about uh, method as a way of trying to characterise and reflect on my own practice here. And there are two main things that I want to draw out that I think are specific about this intervention. The first is the focus on affect. The paper is preceded by trying to attend to my discussants' affective responses when they first learn something of PrEP. Affect can be defined as a domain of pre-personal or transpersonal intensities that emerge as bodies affect one another, a register of responsiveness, responsiveness that can, in this sense, be hard to get a sense of from transcribed interviews.
So this approach directs attention to a new point of focus, the affective conditions in which practical responses to HIV and apprehensions of preventive objects take shape. I think this focus may provide another more nuanced way of thinking about the ways in which stigma interferes with care. I've argued that these patterns, which in this instance have followed a general pattern of interest, surprise, disturbance, and then some form of repudiation, condemnation, or moralism, tell us something about orientations to HIV risk in the sexual present. But it's worth emphasising, I think, that these patterns are themselves dynamic and in process. They should not be understood as a fixed property of psychologised subjects. Apprehensions of PrEP will change as PrEP enters into various forms of circulation, and it's difficult to predict just what will take place and how. I do not see, in other words, these affective responses as natural, essential or inherent psychological reactions to PrEP. Rather, they relate to how sex, risk and PrEP are discursively, historically and scientifically enacted. Whatever else it is, PrEP is an event, and as Marian Fraser has explained, all those who are touched by an event define and are defined by it, whether they are aligned with or opposed to it. That is, they become part of the event's effects. In seeking to open PrEP out into a consideration of different orientations to sexual risk, this paper thus seeks to participate in this process of eventuation. The second thing I wanted to draw attention to is the paper's use of anecdote, that widespread but customarily degraded form of knowledge and relation. And I want to situate the anecdote as a research device with the potential to intervene in conventional arrangements of knowledge and intimacy. Now, I'm not getting autoethnographic here. I don't imagine that I'm nearly that interesting. I'm rather more interested in the tactical use of anecdote as a way of deflating the self and sharing a world that is intimately but differently experienced. The dictionary definition of anecdote is a short, amusing or interesting story about a real incident of private life. And as a way of describing the genre, this definition is fitting. Since it moves an incident of private life into broader circulation, we might say that the anecdote interferes with the normal compartmentalisation of sex, knowledge, privacy, intimacy, etc. I'm interested in the anecdote's capacity to produce a form of knowledge that is partial and fragmentary, but also intimate and textured. Its awareness of its own provisionality is precisely the point here, and in this sense it contrasts markedly with the sort of definitive knowledge that the organised field, field of HIV science purports to produce. Though it gives insight into some of the terms of lived experience, the anecdote does not seek representativeness. It does not aim to represent a given culture or community comprehensively. Rather, it stages the empirical as an encounter or an event that is specific, contingent and open-ended, but that we nonetheless might find ways of relating to. The anecdote does not work as a singular gold standard of evidence, and that really would be a scary thought. Rather, it must be thought in webbed connection with the findings of other modes of knowledge. The science studies scholar Mike Michael has riffed on the anecdote as a research device in which an event is not simply reflected, but also acted on, that is, performative. But Michael is also alive to the sense in which anecdotalization acts upon us, its capacity to disturb given relations of knowledge. From this perspective, the anecdote can be approached as an unsettling device, a source of lived impact from which the identities of the research, researcher and researched emerge in new relation. So this is why I want us, I want us to be prepared to be surprised by our encounters and have tried to install um, this surprise as some sort of methodological principle. I'm also interested in the anecdote's capacity to reframe private experience as incidental and eventful rather than always available to complete control or easy mastery. What is it to attend to the incident and make an anecdote of its occurrence? Well, a funny thing happened to me on the way to the conference. I began to theorise the anecdote instead of just telling one. And then what happened? And she said this, and the rest is up to you. In other words, the anecdote can function to make a joke of the sovereign subject, staging all those little failures to control one's actions or their effects or abide entirely by their design.
This might help direct attention to the contingencies of risk or the contingencies of the erotic encounter, a dimension that might well be better attended to. Which is to say that the incidental subject could be one way of refusing the pull of the doctrines of prediction and intentionality that emanate from the disciplinary practices of the health sciences, which I mentioned at the outset of this paper. It may supply a welcome and perhaps necessary alternative to the rational, intentional subject that has become such a feature of progressive HIV education discourse today. That is, the subject who only needs to calculate the risks of particular acts in order to engage in HIV prevention responsibility, uh, responsibly. And I don't know if you know, have similar campaigns here, but in Australia, you know, we have our latest campaign is this campaign called Know the Risks, which uh, has various sorts of calculation devices as though, you know, the beginning and end of, of, of education is just that people know what risk various acts is, rather than thinking about what it is to actually be in a sexual encounter and what the sort of contingencies of that sexual encounter might be and how they might play out. That, to me, is actually what we should be doing in, in HIV education. So to approach private experience as incidental and eventful is to attend more carefully and actively to the contingencies of events in their unfolding and then to circulate this training of the attention. In the anecdote, objects misbehave, worlds impact events. People don't just act on things, things happen to people. And this could derail some of the force of those accounts steeped in myths of self-mastery. So it's in this sense that I'm interested in the anecdote as a precise intervention into given relations of knowledge, intimate experience, engagements with medicine, etc. It's not about me and it's not about you, but about encounters that we can find ways of relating to. That's it.